Good morning, everybody. As I said before, I'm Pastor Dave. I'm the youth pastor here. I'm so honored to be here. Pastor Dennis is on vacation, so uh, if you could pray for him. Uh, and uh, oh, there's my slides right there. Awesome. So today we're going to talk about what do you do when you stumble. But that's not the only topic we're going to be discussing today. I promise it's not going to be too long, but uh, we're also going to be talking about food and trains and attitudes and a whole bunch of stuff, but don't worry, it'll all fit together. I'm going to give you five examples of what to do when you do stumble. The good Lord came here as fully God and fully man to take our sins, bear our, all our inequities, and die for them. But he didn't do it out of weakness. He did it out of strength. He could have saved himself. He could have stopped himself. He did it because he loves us. And in Psalm 51, that's what that's all about. After King David stumbles, he has to then turn around and try to come back from that stumble. Last week we heard Pastor Dennis talk about a fellow pastor that had a difficult time that stumbled and he had to go chase after him. So what's the difference between somebody stumbling and being overjudgmental? You hear the term legalistic a lot. And we don't want to be overlegalistic about certain things, but if you see a brother or sister Straying off the path, it would behoove us to help them out. The, uh, the great pastor, Billy Graham, used to liken it to this. He, he was talking about an actual example that happened back in the late 70s where a bridge went out during a storm and a guy got out of his car and started trying to wave people down with a flashlight. And of course, back in the 70s, flashlights weren't very bright. People thought, what a, what's this crazy lunatic doing in the middle of the road with a flashlight? And they just kept driving around him. And... Uh, going over the bridge. And Billy Graham likened it a lot, the ministry to that, trying to wave people down, warn them that there's danger ahead. You know, we always hear, don't help a friend out with a speck in their eye when you have a log in yours. But what if your friend's going towards disaster? Shouldn't that uh, allow us to help? Sometimes we have to do the difficult things and talk to people and tell them what their error is. We also have to help them out And hopefully they do the same because a true friend will do that for each other. And so to demonstrate that, I got a little, couple little uh, toys here. And if you have any kids, you probably recognize this here. This is the dinosaur train. Um, I stole this from little Gideon this morning. Um, It was in my bag, and I kept hearing this. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's a choo-choo noise. On the way here, it kept going off. (laughs) But it's like... When you're on a track, when a train is going down the track, it doesn't take much to switch it from one track to the next. A simple shift of a lever will move it 180 degrees. And as you're going down that track, if you get on the wrong track and the bridge is out ahead, it's going to hurt to jump off that train as it's moving. It's going to hurt a lot more if that train goes over the tracks. We don't want to let somebody go off the tracks completely. It's better to take that small fall than it is to go off the tracks completely. And in Psalm 51, we see Nathan has to tell the king about his mistakes. He sees King David going down the wrong path. His sin affects everybody around him. He's ruling a country, but for some reason, he's doing the wrong thing. It's terrible when you see a leader doing that, isn't it? Scary. It's worrisome. It's funny. In the Old Testament, we see the judges who are more like a representative government who are kind of the advocate for the people and to God, and that's more of what God likes. And then when the people see the nations around them having a king, they also want a king, and he says, why, I'm your king. Now, they are graced with David, and David does mostly a good job, but he does screw up. Everybody knows his sin with Bathsheba. It's not hidden, just like the church. And and one thing that I want to point out is in the church, I've heard people say, not in this specific church, I've not heard that, but... In many churches, I've heard people say things like, I don't like organized religion. That always sounds kind of odd to me. So what, you like disorganized religion? Is that, I don't know. Uh, God gives us the Bible, and it is organized. It's organized for us to be able to read, to understand. And yes, there has been some denominations in the past that have caused a lot of problems by adding to the rules to try to get people to obey the other rules or making unholy deals with their government to try to further a specific agenda. 
And that's made problems for us even today. We hear it now with certain policies and procedures that come out and people will say, oh, those Christians are just bigoted. They're, they're this, they're that. And it becomes a problem. I remember when I was doing a lot of my studies, one of the old phrases from about five, 600 years ago was, a coin that hits the coffer, a soul goes to heaven. And a church tried to do that to try to raise money, saying that you'd go to heaven, your, your, your people that were passed away would go to heaven if you donated money, which is not true at all. That's not how it goes. So when we stumble, we miss out on God's goodness. We miss out on a lot of things, a relationship with our Lord. We miss out on a blessing. King David knew this when he stumbled, when he fell, when he had that difficult time. I'm going to read to you Psalm 51. And King David afterwards says all these things out. He writes this song for God because he's so thankful that he got his blessings back, his ministry, not only to the people, but to the world, because they were supposed to be the light to the world, and he was missing out on a lot and steering people astray because he was a leader. A lot was expected of him. Nathan, the prophet, came to him and had to give him the bad news. Can you imagine going to a king and giving him bad news that he doesn't want to hear, and basically telling him, you're wrong? It's a guy who can immediately have you executed. But it takes a true friend to take that step. But King David recounts, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away my inequity, and cleanse me from my sin. Now back then, everything was recorded on papyrus scrolls. So if they made a mistake, they would actually have to physically blot it out. And that's what he's referring to there, like like a uh, diary of wrongdoings. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now, he does say that here, against you only. What he means is you are the greatest. uh, The greatest sin. Because he does sin against Uriah, having him murdered. He does sin against Bathsheba as well. And justified you are with your judge. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me, yet you desire faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me the wisdom in that secret place. We'll come back to that in a second. Cleanse me with the hyssop. I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear the joy and gladness. Let my bones you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my inequities. Create me a pure heart, O God, and renew my steadfast spirit within. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me your joy of salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach your transgression, or your Teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You are my God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O Lord, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in the bull offerings offered whole. The bulls will be offered in your altar. So that last part is a, he's discussing the coming exile. But before that, we hear about the hyssop branch, which was a branch that was used to put the blood on the top of the doors during the Passover. It was also used for a lot of healing. And before that, we hear about the womb. That's one of many verses that we hear throughout Scripture indicating that 
a child at conception is actually a child. Three things happen when a child is conceived. Number one, the actual genetics are determined for the first and only time in a person's life. Number two, the uh, right amount of chromosomes are added. Number three, the sex is determined. That's the only time in a human being's life that that happens. In a few short weeks, a heart begins to beat and pain receptors are formed. This particular sermon isn't about that, but that's one of many verses, and I thought it kind of interesting with the way things are going today and the way people want to point out things about conception. And a man and a woman definitely have the right to love each other and be passionate about each other, and that's not what that's about. But King David goes to the Lord with a broken and contrite heart, he says. People are looking up to him for an example, and he's required to be that example for other people. Yet he ignores the Lord, and he goes on the wrong track. It didn't take much but a simple glance at Bathsheba to turn all this stuff against God. Now, when he's praying, he's not praying for his salvation because he knows he's a man after God's own heart. He loves the Lord. He's praying to get his righteousness back, his blessing, the Holy Spirit. When we turn away from God, we lose out on so much. And it's more dangerous when somebody is watching but doesn't yet believe in the Lord. He says, I want to sing and declare your praises. He wants to bring people to God. He knows that God is the one, the true, the, the way, the truth, and the life. One of my favorite uh, guys to listen to is Tom Dooley. Unfortunately, he passed away back in 2010. Um, he talks about this, though, and I thought it was specifically very cool that the way he puts this. And he says, out of sin, Bathsheba... Uh, with, out of the sin with Bathsheba, David tries to cover things up. It's a high cost of sinning. David's whole being was affected by the sin. He lost fellowship with God. He lost the joy of the Lord. And just for the brief pleasures of sin, he pays this great price. Sin hurts everybody around us, and it brings tragedy. The consequences of this life of others, especially one's own family. David's sin led to Uriah's death, Bathsheba's baby died, David's lovely daughter Tamar was violated her brother Am, by her brother Amnon. Amnon was then killed by Absalom, his brother. The whole family was just a mess, he says. I love that, just a mess. Seems like it's almost difficult, almost too much to fix, but it is. And it began all back with David and Bathsheba. By the way, Absalom was then slain by Joab, who was the, the uh, leader of David's army. The sin just kept manifesting and going forward. Sin has a power all of its own when we give sway to it. It is a fleeting moment of pleasure. Is that really worth all the sorrow? Of course not. Sin hurts God as well. Sin makes us dirty. Sin is a rebellion against God and his holy law. If you want to know how much sin hurts God, go to Calvary and see his son bleeding and dying on the cross for the sins of the world. God is pure love and, and our selfishness breaks his heart. God is merciful and gracious and forgives when we come in repentance and faith. David did not want cheap forgiveness. He came with a broken and contrite heart. It's funny how one little sin becomes the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And pretty soon, your whole life is a mess. The other day, I was, uh, it was actually a couple months ago, I thought of this, and I thought I would bring this to church when I do the next uh, sermon. But I love hot sauce. Does anybody else love hot sauce in here? This isn't a trick or anything like that. Absolutely love hot so sauce. There's shows out there where celebrities eat hot sauce at various times, and um, this is actually from a show, it's called The Last Dab Hot Sauce, and it was, they eat wings in, in hotter and hotter hot sauce as they do interviews with these celebrities, and uh, this is the last one because they try to put an extra dab of hot sauce on there. It's supposed to be super hot, um, but it's one of my favorites. It's got a really nice smoky flavor to it. Um, so the other day, uh, about a month ago, my lovely wife here, Tanya, she decided to make macaroni and cheese. Uh, I love to put hot sauce on my mac and cheese. So I grabbed this from the fridge, uh, looked pretty clean at the time, unscrewed the top, put my hot sauce on there, and ate my dinner. We were watching some TV, and afterwards, 
I was sitting there and my eye itched, so I reached up kind of like this and did one of those. Didn't take long to realize there must have been a little hot sauce on the cap that my finger had touched, just the oil. Couldn't even see it, but just that little bit of oil sent my, uh, my eye into a, a little fireball. Um, but it's a great picture of sin and how easily it can spread without even knowing it. One bad decision can lead down that road. I used to have a friend that I work with um, at my other job. He's still there. I don't get to see him as much as I normally do, but he used to stumble all the time on purpose. He would walk up steps and hit the steps, and he'd throw everything out of his hands and try to <laughs> see who would, who would get a kick out of it. He's a, a silly guy, but I thought about doing that coming up the steps here, but I'm like, you know what, if I try to do it, I'll do it on, actually and fall flat on my face. <laughs> so what do we do when, when we stumble? Because stumbling is inevitable. Like I talked about earlier, with churches, when you have that, I don't like organized religion, what they really mean is they don't like the church they were in, or they don't like certain behaviors of people in the church. And now I've said, people are watching, but even though we are a house for the Lord, we're also a house of truth. Because we see here that David, being one of the heroes of faith, he messed up big. Murder and adultery. I mean, that, that's pretty big. But yet he's still being forgiven. It's still okay. We're going to expect some mistakes, even from people in here. It's all right. When we talk about a church, we're not just a body of believers. This place, a gathering of people, is for... A, for help. It's a hospital for the needy. Like Jesus says, it's not the well that need a doctor, the sick. So we have to expect some mess. It's okay to have a little bit of mess. But what do we do when we stumble? How do we remedy that? Well, the first thing is we pray and address the one true God. As David says, have mercy according to your unfailing love. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away my inequities. Make it so it doesn't even matter anymore. Like it never happened. God's blood is good enough. He decided to go to that cross for us specifically. He didn't do it by accident. It's okay. He can blot it out. Honor him by understanding that he's good enough. Number two, you confess. Against you only, God, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. God's Laws are not there to try to keep us down. They're there to help us. Like a little kid touching a fire. You tell him, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. God knows best. He wrote us an entire book so that way we could have all the rules, all the guidelines, really. It's something that a lot of people look at and go, oh, I, I don't want to believe this or that. You can't take just part of it. You've got to take the whole thing. Because he gave us all that on purpose. If God is big enough to create the world, he can create a book. Uh, number three, you repent. There we go. You repent. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness again. When things aren't going well, and we know we're doing something wrong, it's very quick that we can see joy and gladness leave our life. Anxiety, depression, fear, anger. All those things start to creep in. I was blessed to be able to do a grief care session with people here, and it was awesome. I think it was really good to understand what it's like on both sides because that anxiety, that fear, anger, depression, it's just when something bad you're doing, it can be from somebody else too. And you see how little things can become big things. And how when you have something in the back of your head that's bothering you, you become anxious, angry, and upset. And sometimes it's because it's something else that somebody else does to you. God forgives us, and we have to forgive them too. However, I will say this, it's been said before that to truly understand forgiveness, you have to understand evil. We can't make excuses for evil and bad things that happen out there. We have to admit when something is bad and wrong. It's not being judgmental, it's being honest. If you understand what evil is, you understand what it took for God to forgive us, to truly understand what he's given us. So after you repent, 
Renew your relationship with God. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew my steadfast spirit within me. And finally, number five, delight in God's precious gift and spread the good news and my mouth will declare your praises. God gives us the good news not so we can hide it under a bushel so that way we can spread the good news around. What is the good news? If you don't know what the good news is, if you don't know what God's promise is to all of us here, I'll give you the quick version. And little hint, it has to do with the, the memory verse. God understood that we need a sacrifice to cover us all because we've messed up, right? None of us are here, unless Jesus comes walking through that door right now, none of us here are perfect, me included. And he understood that. He sent his only son as both fully God and fully man. He led a sinless life of a virgin birth. He died on the cross to take our debt. And then God raised him on the third day. And then he ascended to heaven to be at the right hand of the Father, to be our priest, to be our advocate. That's the 60-second gospel. If this is new for you, that's, that's all salvation is. You believe that in your heart of hearts and declare that with your mouth, that means you're saved. You're, you're good. You're going to spend the rest of eternity with our Father. That's a beautiful thing, that, that we can have that. That God will blot out all our sins for us, erase what we've done. We have to still be careful. That doesn't mean we just throw caution to the wind and, well, you know what, I'm going to sin some more. No, because sin, just like that hot sauce, will easily spread. And you can walk away from God's blessings in life. We don't want to turn others away. But that's all you need to know. And if you just would pray with me, the simple prayer, you too can be saved if you don't already know it. And I'd like to pray real quick with everybody. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for all these people here today. I thank you that they all came with an open heart. Lord, I pray that anybody that doesn't yet know you comes to know you. I pray that if they pray the simple prayer that God, I believe you said you sent your son to die in my stead, to take all my transgressions up on that cross and to forgive my debts and that Jesus rose again on the third day that these people are saved, Lord. I pray that they all get into the Bible and read and have a relationship with you because it's such a beautiful thing that you've given us. I sing your praises, Lord, and thank you for your love, your grace, and the law that helps keep us in your goodness, that keeps us from being dirty. Lord, bless all these people here before us today. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I believe that you've been saved. It's all about your belief.